Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for hosting me and uh, for hosting this uh, enticing and wonderful panel. Um, uh, we uh, structured in conversation with our guests uh, the panel as a, as a round table. So uh, before introducing the speaker, just setting the rule of the game, um, we will start with a, a series of pitches, of um, opening speeches from each of the participants, uh, three minutes more or less. And it will follow it by a first round of question and answer, and then we'll open up uh, the floor to all attendants so that uh, you have the occasion to to ask your question and to to contribute to the conversation. Uh, maybe first some uh, few words about uh, the, the approach that we decided to take. Uh, uh, the title of the panel is Navigating the Data Rights Minefield. And uh, I will probably start by putting a question mark uh, about what we understand when we speak about data, what we speak understand when we speak about rights and why and how we understand to call it a minefield. And um, in the pitch, I asked uh, uh, each of the participants to try to, to, to present from their standing point, from the viewpoint, uh, what do they understand to be the main EU approach to data? So what do we understand when we speak about a European approach to data? Uh, is it just data protection? Is it a concern with uh, artificial intelligence? It is something concerning infrastructure, digital sovereignty, and so on and so forth. So uh, I would like to, to briefly introduce uh, the speakers. So we have five fantastic speakers today. First of all, uh, Mr. Werner Stang is a cabinet expert in the cabinet of uh, vice president of the European Commission, Margaret Vestager. Among his responsibilities are key elements of our digital lives, such as uh, digital policy, artificial intelligence, and that economy, the platform economy, and disinformation. We'll then welcome the Honorable uh, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri. Uh, she is a rapporteur of the European Strategy for Data, I believe one of the most important pieces of legislation we are currently discussing at EU level. Uh, we'll then follow with the uh, um, Madam Ellen Dixon, she is the Data Protection Commissioner of Ireland. And as you all know, Ireland is kind of a crucial pivotal country in Europe because it's uh, the EU lead supervisory authority under the GDPR for many of the world's largest internet platforms. We will then uh, follow with uh, uh, Mr. David Stevens, who is the uh, chairman of the Belgian Data Protection Authority. And I'm extremely interested to hear his point of view on what is happening in Europe in terms of data protection and data policies. And uh, finally, but not least, but not last, but not least, <laughs> um, uh, Lurihan uh, um, uh, Ansenis, uh, she's a uh, heads of the Tech and Data Practice of the Paris Office of the business law firm Allen and Overy. She specializes in technology law and data protection and advises both French and international clients on the digitalization of their activities, the establishment of strategic partnership, as well as cybersecurity issues and data monetization. She's also a member of the Paris and Madrid Bars and solicitor in England, and she has recently been awarded uh, Young Leader of the French China Foundation, so I expect like to, to get like a, a broader global understanding of the issues at stake. Werner, may I ask you to, to kick off with uh, your pitch? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Many thanks for the invite. Uh, three minutes for the European data policy. That's quite a challenge. Uh, first answer to your question. Yes, we do have a European data policy. Uh, you said, is it about infrastructure? Is it about sovereignty? Is it about data protection? Is it about artificial intelligence? Uh, yes, it's all of this. Uh, it's part of our overarching digital strategy where we have several overarching priorities that also apply to data. It's about human centric technology. It's about inclusive that everybody can take part, nobody left behind. It's about pro innovation, pro competitiveness. It's about resilience, especially after COVID or due to the experience made during COVID. And it's about fair and open markets. So we have the double objective for data on the one hand to promote innovation, on the other hand to promote trust. And they both actually are interdependent. So promote the use of data. That's, of course, the pro innovation objective. This is about making data available more than today. Uh, lots of them machine generated data, uh, non personal data, of course, also mixed data sets for companies to develop great services on the basis of data. Also for societies to benefit from data advances in terms of health policy, uh, mobility, what have you. But then it's also to protect, but not just to protect, but also empower citizens. 
give people greater control over their data. That it's not just a question of being protected and clicking away your rights uh, with a consent window, but actually making active use of your data, being in control of that. Um, what are we doing? We, of course, promote investment in the data economy, in cloud and all the rest of it. It's part of the European Digital Decade 2030 policy program. Uh, but there's also a lot of legislation, uh, just to name the headlines, there's no time to go into these. The Data Governance Act, to have trustworthy data intermediaries. The Data Act, to go into this question of data sharing, data rights, who should get what part of the data value chain. It's about the EID proposal. How can we ourselves identify ourselves online to obtain public or private services? It's about the Digital Services Act uh, to get better information about how my data is used to push advertising or, or, or content to me. And it's the data, the Digital Markets Act. It's about market power. How is data used by large companies or in, in their own favor sometimes? How can we avoid lock-in situations? So data all over the place, essential raw material, uh, and we have a double-pronged approach, innovation and trust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this exercise in, uh, in speed and uh, precision. Um, can, we, can I ask uh, Honorable uh, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri uh, your point of view? Thank you. Uh, it was good exercise to do all that we are doing in five years in three minutes by the previous speaker, Pierre Werner. So he he gave the law proposals that we, Europe is actually doing uh, what should have been maybe done a bit earlier before we had this data in the hands of you, because in the European way of thinking of the markets, we have to have a competition and a multiple players. But it's also that what we did uh, uh, on the GDPR, it means that the privacy of the data is there to be uh, taken on board whatever we do with the data. So if the question was, is the European po data policy for AI or sovereignty or for security, it is that yes, yes and yes. So uh, it is a good fuel for AI and more innovation but we want to see how to uh, create the access for the data and, and who get the access and, and, and uh, what kind of data is available. We do not want to have the bias data to be uh, then later biasing the solutions that the, for example, AI systems are providing for us. So I also think that it, it is not a sector non, not to go to when the, the legislators want to have their say, because we live in the democracies and the power needs to be in the hands of uh, people. And when the people have the uh, data and knowledge and information in their hands, we can exercise democracies. So if it's in the power or hands of few only, uh, and they are using it in the wrong way, we have the uh, economy where only the health wealthy or the money talks, and if it's in the hands of you as a government only, it's some sort of authoritarian systems. So we need to have the, the people have a say also on the technology when and how and what purposes for it is used. So uh, on the, the data strategy, I was uh, happy to be the rapporteur of the parliament and, and got a strong support already on March. So data is uh, something that makes it us uh, better, uh, wealthier, uh, takes us to the future with the innovations, but then we have some framework where we want to guide it. And I'm in two hours, I will meet uh, the other rapporteurs from the European Parliament of the Data Governance Act. And, and there I just would add that it is important that we create the data economy with the values and with the uh, structures also that there are interoperability, which takes us back to the market economy where we can flourish with the new innovations. All, and also I think the AI Act needs to be mentioned here because it is also that what you can do with the data. And I think uh, you have to uh, be aware and digital literacy, all that uh, important things that we have to do as a citizens, but also we have to be able to trust on the products on the markets. Like we want to trust on the vaccinations and medicines, 
also the high-risk AI applications built on the data. So this is a scratch of the data thoughts I have. Thank you very much. Thank you again for, for your exercise. I know it, it was a, an hard one. Uh, Ellen, may I ask you to intervene? Uh, Ellen, I believe your micro has not been unmuted yet. Ah, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Rocco, and thank you uh, to my fellow panelists for this very unique opportunity, I think, to debate and discuss today. Probably not surprisingly, I'm going to emphasize in terms of talking about the EU approach to data, the data protection elements, of course, given that I represent a data protection authority, but I think also uh, because of the very elevated status of personal data and the protection of personal data, in the EU legal order recognized through the Lisbon Treaty, Article 8 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So as the previous speakers have talked about, the EU clearly has a very strong EU data strategy. There's a very strong package on the table at the moment with the DSA, the DMA, the AI proposed regulation, the Data Governance Act as just mentioned, but nonetheless, data protection and the personal, the, the protection of personal data uh, comes into all of these. Um, ju just moving on to, to reference the second part of your question, Rocco, which was what we might understand as the data rights minefield. One of the comments I would make is that, of course, if you're a big internet platform that monetizes EU personal data, there can't be any doubt but that the GDPR, the flagship data protection law, applies to the processing done by that platform, that there's going to be a lot of media, academic, NGO and regulatory scrutiny and that delivery on rights of individ individuals is going to be absolutely essential. So while I think we're moving into a phase now, happily, a phase that's going to bring us greater certainty in terms of the interpretation of GDPR, we're moving into a phase now where we see decisions of, of regulatory bodies like, like my own contested in the courts and the positive side of that, as I said, is going to be certainty. So I think in one sense, there is no data rights minefield for the big platforms and those that the GDPR unambiguously applies to. There are challenges, which we'll talk about this afternoon, for them in implementing the GDPR, uh, but at least there's a certainty in terms of its application. I think just as a finishing point, the, the comment I would make about where I see the data rights minefield currently relates perhaps to smaller players and operators uh, that end up coming perhaps unintentionally under the remit of the GDPR. So maybe a local football club that implements a disciplinary process against a player and that player complains to the data protection authority, we end up looking at the disciplinary process and putting it under the GDPR rule and finding it doesn't comply or a volunteer secretary, perhaps, of a local residence association that gives out a mobile telephone number of one neighbor to another and appears then to end up in GDPR hot water. So I think one of the things to comment about about the EU's data protection law is that it's very broad in scope and almost endless in application. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thank you for highlighting also the variety of factors at play, and uh, including the small businesses or just individual citizen. Uh, David, may I ask you to to follow up on a data protection uh, perspective? Yes, thank you, uh, Rocco, and thank you, colleagues, for uh, the interesting thoughts. I think I think I can just uh, add a, a number of uh, of thoughts. First of all. If we talk about the data rights uh, minefield, what do I consider as the data rights minefield? I think it exists. Uh, I think it's the, it relates to the complexity of life and to the complexity of the legal and regulatory frameworks which we have in place and which were usually uh, not adapted to situations like we uh, encounter today. But the minefield from a legal regulatory point of view, I think it relates to to a number of uh, legal and, and regulatory frameworks we have in place in Europe. Uh, for example, not to start with data protection, intellectual property rights in, in uh, today's society. Um, it could be AVMS, audiovisual media services, so the regulation of media. It could relate to non-personal data. It could relate to 
information uh, society services. And I think those sets of le legislation, regulation in Europe, which all date from different uh, dates and all have different origin and all are moving uh, targets in a way, uh, the application of them to a complex life as we encounter it today from time to time is difficult. It's not only difficult for citizens, it might be difficult for uh, companies to, uh, to really find out what the precise interpretation to be given is. Um, so I think there is a minefield. I think the I think it's the complexity of life. Probably every generation uh, has thought that their life was the most complex uh, until now, and probably we think it often uh, too. That's the, the data rights minefield from a legal and regulatory uh, point of view. Of course, as a, the chairman of a data protection authority, just like like Helen, I am a strong believer of the potential of data protection. But I would make one remark. I'm not so sure that we are quickly moving towards legal certainty. Uh, I fully agree on the remarks which uh, Helen made about some kind of de minimis regal, uh, uh, rule. Sorry, um, We should not uh, embarrass too many different, not too problematic situations, the local football team and so on and so on. So we need some kind of cutoff uh, border, I think, or threshold uh, to which we, we don't want to apply those rules. Otherwise, and I think I'm, in, I'm in, in good company saying it, otherwise the GDPR will very, short, very uh, shortly become, um, well, the most non-respected or neglected set of regulation at the European level. So the, uh, the point I want to make, I think the GDPR, the application, as, as uh, Helen said, is very broad and the, um, it, it's th that broad that it becomes difficult uh, to really uh, uh, to really grasp what the consequences are. And, and so data protection and GDPR becomes um, becomes uh, a, a, a minefield in its own. Uh, and I'm uh, the reason why I was saying I think I'm in good company is because I read similar remarks in an opinion of the Advocate General. It's not the court itself, but it's the Advocate General saying that the current approach is gradually uh, transforming the GDPR into one of the most uh, disregarded legislative frameworks and so on and so on. He says, essentially, we need to revisit the scope of the GDPR. And I think uh, somehow we need to do that. There are very good basic principles in the GDPR. An application might be broader than what we have today. Um, and it, uh, GDPR definitely has a role to play in the digital uh, future of tomorrow. That's my thought. Thank you very much, David. And I see lot of questions piling up already. Uh, Lauriane, may I ask you to follow up? Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and nice to be with you today. Um, I think, indeed, the topic of the day is quite broad, and perhaps to state the obvious, I think it covers both, if we look at the concepts, uh, personal data and non-personal data. Um, personal data, obviously, as everybody knows, being any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, a data subject, and by identifiable, we mean who can be identified directly or indirectly, um, for instance, by a reference number. When it comes to non-personal data, we are talking about what is basically not personal. So it can be really broad and it's um, precisely set by the regulation on the free flow of data, which is at this stage probably one of the main legal instruments governing the, the circulation of non-personal data. If we look at the rights, we should probably make a distinction between the rights of data subjects, which as my colleague pointed out, are clearly defined by the GDPR in the EU or by any other applicable data protection um, legislation, um, I mean national legislations in the EU, um, we should dis make a distinction between those rights of data subjects and the rights of businesses in a B2B context in relation to both personal and non-personal data. Um, if we look closely perhaps at non-personal data, um, ownership of data doesn't really exist officially. This is the reason why I think we mainly talk about use and rights to rights to use data. And I think this is the, the topic of the day. Um, if we look at B2B, 
uh, relationships um, because we have um, few regulations when it comes to non-personal data. What companies tend to do is to basically enter into contracts to protect their rights and to define their obligation when, it's, when it comes to that use of data. We see companies implementing assessment tools to identify key data, to balance their risk and, and rewards, and to actually um, clearly define their contractual rights in a contract. Um, so perhaps to get into more closely into the, the data rights that the parties may allocate to, to each other in, in, a, in a contractual relationship, answer to that question is actually um, uh, not well defined because it may depend on, on a number of parameters. Um, these may vary depending on the transactions you're talking about, the nature of counterparties, the nature of the data at stake. Are we talking about valuable data, sensitive data? Are we including data flows in the transaction? Um, where, where is the data coming from? What is the source of the data? And then there is also another layer to take into account, which I think my colleague David has been pointing out, which is the, the other types of restrictions that you may have in relation to data. Um, the, the data legislation on its own is, is not enough to look at, and I think data should not be looked at in isolation. Um, there are other restrictions like IP, um, IP rights, telecommunications rights, um, security requirements sometimes who do affect data rights. Um, so all of these all of these elements sh should be taken into account and really data rights, I believe, are at the intersection of many different considerations. And, and sometimes actually um, legal restrictions uh, are not the only one to take into account as we as we said before, um, security or technical solutions are also um, restricting restricting rights um, as such. Thank you very much, uh, Lorion. Uh, now we move then to the second uh, uh, part, so rather the, the exchange, and I have some questions, and uh, I also hope that you will have questions for your your fellow panelists. And uh, maybe I, I will start with the, with the, um, with the, what uh, Lorian was just saying about uh, the different kind of restrictions that applies to, to data and uh, to, to think broader than data protection or to go beyond this data protection thinking that sometimes hamper uh, or haunt uh, European approaches. Uh, it's a little bit what David also was saying. And there is a saying, critical data studies that say that uh, data, raw data are an oxymoron, that data always arrive cooked somehow. They are already pre-structured, pre defined and that the question is how do we transform data rather than how do we uh, collect data as they were just um, normal things and that are given. Uh, so what is like from that perspective uh, the unicity or not of a European approach to data? Do you think that a European approach still is able to, 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 to grasp the fact that data are not oil? or something that needs to be refined or something that needs to be cared, uh, to be protected and so on. Do you see a difference in Europe emerging compared to other uh, players uh, around the world or not? Or it's something that is missing in all these legislative forests that is emerging? Maybe Werner, I think that you are the one that is more on the top of the different legislative initiatives. I think it's it's really, as I tried to say in my introduction, a, a very mixed set of objectives. We're probably trying to, to achieve three objectives at least at the same time, right? So we are seeing uh, data as an important raw material, as also Mia Petra said, yeah, for, the, for, for AI, for other use cases, to further competitiveness and, and so on and so forth. So we're trying to, to unleash the potential of the data economy, which is probably pretty much a business sort of angle. Of course, with on the one hand, citizens should still, their rights should be properly protected and they should also benefit at the end of the day from data generated innovations. The other discussion is more around the citizen itself. And here, I think we are way beyond the pure data protection narrative. Of course, we all agree data protection is, is, is of the essence. I think we all agree with David that enforcement uh, is, an, is an issue. But I think all the legal acts that I mentioned 
And they want, first of all, they all build on the GDPR. None of them in any way deviates from this. It's always the starting point. Second, however, we want to go beyond this and usually with those proposals uh, empower citizens in a way. Uh, and if it's not that, at the very least, there, sh there should be a, a reinforcing effect on the enforceability of the GDPR because we're bringing so much more light into this, into the darkness, right? I mentioned the DSA, right? I would see in the future why I am seeing an ad. I would know that I was the subject of targeted advertising. I know why I see a certain recommended content. So there, there is a link, of course, right, to data protection, because I might start wondering where the hell do they get all this information about me? So it, at least it, it raises my awareness as a citizen. If it's about AI, then it's, it's also about uh, data, data quality, data bias, but also origin of data. Because if I have to be transparent about my AI system, then I also have to say where I got my data from. And I cannot devise some, some software for the police uh, and say, well, I, I used Facebook data or this data or that data. So we bring many things to the open that will pursue their own policy objectives, empowerment, this, that, or the other, but may also be very beneficial for our friends, Helen and David, uh, in, in, in going after our, uh, in protecting our data rights. Thank you very much. Uh, Mia Petra, if I may ask you to, to, to jump in, uh, what's your European Parliament perspective on that? Also, I think we have a clear majority that we will not touch and open the GDPR for, for the disappointment of uh, authorities that should uh, work at it. You were worried uh, uh, that, that there is too much work for the citizens. I, I think it's very much work for you as the authorities, and I'm sorry for that, for the legislative size. But I, I think we have to have the values, and I do represent the values of the people. Uh, and then uh, the value is that you know about your own data, and then uh, I, what I th if there is a hope to open the GDPR, it's more or less that how can I, I track that? So it's a common joke in between that I can ask the company that, hey, by the way, what data you have to me? That, uh, yeah, according to GDPR, take and fax it to me in 30 days. Nice. So it's not really what is the meant. Uh, of the idea of the transparency. So it's also nice the tests that where, where your data is going when you open the internet page and, and then uh, you maybe order something and give your email and, and then this consent when you gave your email then distributes uh, my data all over. So yes, this is the data and it is a lot of work. I do uh, understand that more resources should be needed to the the authorities, but then uh, on the, the local football club or other, I don't know, that discussion took place in, in Finland where I'm, I'm at the moment, like in the time in the, of the uh, G GDPR was introduced and not anymore. Because I'm not happy if if uh, you uh, the lawyers are happy to give your information to a very small company that please you don't have to look after the, my privacy because you are small then maybe you can freely do it there is a possibilities but for for that the the touching even the size that because you are small you actually can uh, forget about my privacy and, and the way you handle my data so so this uh, kind of um, argumentation, it's not very popular in the, in the European Parliament. We want to stand for the citizens. And, and also, I, I have to say that the things are not forbidden. They are, uh, there should be a lot of education and how to do. So the clarity is not easy uh, when you do the complicated issues. So that uh, message I take strongly back. Uh, but then uh, having the idea that we would open it to make it like, if you are small, you don't need to uh, pay attention for the privacy, these kind of wishes. I would ask the uh, commission not to even to try to propose it to the parliament. Ellen, I, I think I see where, where this conversation comes from, and uh, I'd like to give you the possibility to, to further elaborate on, 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 your, on your provocation, let me call it like that. <laughs> yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll come to my, my provocation as the last point. I think I've slightly more hope than, than Werner and David about where enforcement of the GDPR is going. 
because I think the sooner we, 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 we all recognize already it's a principles-based technology neutral law designed to be flexible enough uh, to, to cover any scenario. And so inevitably in the absence of legal precedents and very complex technologies, investigations are complex, they take time, but they're starting to conclude now. And we're seeing what is, I think, inevitable contestation in courts. And that's what's going to deliver the legal certainty uh, of precedential value. So I think over the next couple of years, we're, we're going to build up more and more of that legal certainty. Um, I, I was thinking as Maya Petra was talking about a very interesting debate in the parliament recently where a derogation was passed to the e-privacy law that allows the platforms continue to scan for child sexual abuse material. And it was an incredibly interesting discussion and ultimately adoption of the derogation where not everyone is feeling very satisfied at the outcome and, and still there's a feeling that that privacy is being invaded uh, disproportionately in order to deliver on this good of, of routing out child sexual abuse material. So I think what this demonstrates is there are no black and white and easy cut answers and that's why things are contested, are complicated and, and if you're going to impose a massive sanction on a platform, you need your own investigation and legal reasoning. Uh, well, well thought out. Uh, probably nobody disagrees with that. But maybe just to come back then to the provocation issue and, and Maya Petra's um, latter comments, I don't think for a moment I'm uh, necessarily suggesting that the EU Commission would propose an amendment to the GDPR to eliminate whole swathes of data controllers. Actually, I suppose I'm more addressing myself because one of the um, challenges in regulating under the GDPR is, of course, that we have an obligation to handle every complaint from an individual and investigate it to the extent appropriate, as well as doing the bigger systemic big platform supervision. Uh, and of course, individuals where their neighbor has been given their mobile telephone number see this as a very important issue in some cases for themselves. And so it's about us as regulators reacting proportionately uh, to those kinds of cases that come to us very frequently through individual complaints. So thanks. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, David, uh, uh, I have a couple of questions also, but I, I think that you also want to, to jump into this conversation about the scope of GDPR and the articulation. Yeah, okay. Uh, to a large extent, I think I'm, I, I, I agree with what, uh, what Helen says, that as data protection authorities, I also see it in my own authority that um, the, the, the obligation to deal with almost every complaint of a potential or a, of a citizen or a data subject is quite burdensome. And given that the resources are always limited, um, that's that's a, an, an area of problem also in, in Belgium, I think, and it, it plays for many of us. And I think one of the consequences, we must be honest, one of the consequences is that we maybe over-focus all on national aspects and, and the, the actual Euro European or global enforcement is a little bit uh, behind. Um, but, but, but we'll see and uh, we'll make improvements there, I think, as Helen was doing, I'm also talking uh, to and, and about myself. One of the problems I see, if I go back to the, the idea of the, the data minefield, is that, in a way, our European framework... Uh, let me start with a positive point. I think it's a good thing that we now have a clear European strategy for data, which is quite encompassing. But if I look at the legal and regulatory text and the regulators that the supervisors that exist, it's all quite fragmented. And actually the problems arise or the minefield starts at the borders of every different, um, of every different piece of legislation or regulation. And the child abuse is one example, but there are many examples to be given. I think um, there's also issues when data protection rights are being, or data protection um, provisions are being used by companies that might have worldwide monopolies, uh, but they, they, they abuse data protection to say we cannot give or we cannot share or you cannot do, not do research even on, on pseudonymized data of, of this of this uh, uh, nature. So 
the fragmentation is one of the problems I see. Uh, I'm not pleading for one big European data regulation uh, and, and regulator because uh, we would be uh, regulating entire digital or online lives, but we need to be aware of the fragmentation. And another area of concern, personally, in the minefield idea is that we, to some extent, suffer pod dependency too. I think we are now discussing still a potential regulation on e-privacy because we had a directive on e-privacy and before the directive on e-privacy we had a directive on isdn and before that one we probably had an even earlier version so from time to time we don't think as i think and it's i'm not blaming the commission or the parliament but together we are not sufficiently thinking what is it we want to regulate and how do we efficiently do that uh, we just continue uh, regulations because we have previous uh, versions. So that would be um, an, an area where I think uh, our data policy, and again, where we could do better. And I again, I think we already do to some extent with our and all uh, with the European Commission vision on uh, and strategy for data. But we could do even better. I think. Thank you very much, David uh, Lorion. Um, yes, I, I fully agree on, on the clear EU strategy um, uh, for data, uh, for sure, also on the fragmentation, unfortunately. Um, in France, we also see, obviously, enforcement in relation mm -hmm. to, to data protection, personal data protection um, r rising high. Um, and, and we do have clear examples. Um, so it's, 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 I guess, a good and a bad news because things start to be clear for um, most businesses nowadays and and uh, awareness is being raised but at the same time um you know it, it's been quite tough um for companies um and perhaps um uh, we should uh, i should i should focus on on one point of concern for businesses from from my point of view as a, as a lawyer uh, and when it comes to clarity I'm not so sure about clarity, for instance, in relation to personal data transfers, which is probably one of the, the greatest area of concerns today for, for businesses since the um, ECJ decisions uh, or SHRAMS 2, um, as we are now um, navigating in a, in a very complex environment where EU businesses, this is, I think, where really the complexity starts for EU businesses when they want to send personal data abroad in countries that do not provide for an adequate level of protection and in particular the us um, so i think if we if we if we look closer to 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 that specific scenario um i would i would um i would perhaps um encourage my colleagues to um go into that perhaps that uh, topic um more deeply because we are in a very uh, complicated situation at this point um, companies, even though companies implement standard contractual clause, um, they now need to get into um, that um, transfer impact assessment. They very often need to implement supplementary measures, and even uh, even even with those measures, um, they remain with a great uncertainty on on the possibility to send personal data um, in 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 other countries. Um, especially if if you if you need to send data that will be decrypted at some point by the um, importing countries, so I would uh, perhaps perhaps we can broaden the discussion, which I think um, is is international today. Thank you very much, uh, Lorion. Uh, who who would like to pick up on on, uh, on the on the so difficult topic of of the post life. Uh, Life after Shrimps too. Uh, Mia Petra and then Ellen. Yeah, I, I do understand it. It's uh, the grey time, the the, the 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 time before we get the decision. But then at the same time, I, I'm I'm not the the specialist on that. But we all know that uh, the adequacy decision uh, didn't pass, and 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 the DJ Justice is working yeah. on that. Yeah. But at the same time, I think. Uh, we could look and, and have a seminar with the US participants that why do they have this uh, uh, protection for their data rights and, and privacy of their own, but not, not for the others. So that would be my uh, simple answer that we get the better 
response from the US that they also are curious about the our privacy and not only uh, the privacy of their own citizens. Uh, and that's uh, an important step that we hope that they can move uh, to that direction and then we could then continue with the data economy that it, it is not a kind of surveillance data economy, but it is the same values. And I have, to, all in all, I'm, I'm the vice chair for the US delegation from the European Parliament and followed carefully the ideas on the TTC, the Tech and Trade Council, to also talk to each other across the transatlantic. So the uh, kind of idea that uh, Brussels effect what was uh, it seen on the climate, but it's seen on the privacy issues too. So could we have the transatlantic effect that we have even more democracies that want to keep the power in the hands of the people and then uh, does, do not to see the world as the, the big tech is asking us to see it and the possibilities. So uh, the clearly uh, I'm, I'm in the favor of data to move. I'm in a favor of innovation to move. Uh, we, we need that, but then we shouldn't be that open that please have all data on us and about us uh, without uh, also willingness to protect our privacy. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thanks, Rocco, and thanks, Lorianne, for bringing up this topic, because I think it's another interesting one that demonstrates the complexity of what we're regulating. Um, the reason my office took a case to the Irish High Court for reference to the CJU that resulted in ultimately um, the invalidation of the Privacy Shield um, but the validation of the SCCs as a legal mechanism is precisely because of what you seek. We wanted a, a certain legal interpretation off of which to continue our investigation of Facebook's transfers about which we had a complaint. And the CJU judgment has, of course, moved us on considerably in understanding because one of the big things that it has clarified that was disputed prior to the judgment is that Articles 45 and 46, previously 25 and 26 under the directive, both still require as an outcome essential equivalence in terms of protection. And that previously hadn't been, been accepted. So there's more certainty about the very high standard that's, that's demanded regardless of transfer mechanism. And I don't know whether this will be of comfort to you or not, but we are continuing at full pace now following that CJEU judgment with the investigation we have underway into Facebook's transfers. They judicially reviewed us. The Irish High Court ruled um, and dismissed the judicial review in May, and now we are continuing on. So we will have a definite uh, decision in a very specific case that will apply the judgment and the law. Who knows what contestation that will subsequently go through but we're inching towards certainty if certainty is really what we want in this case. Thank you very much, Helen. And um, maybe I'd like to, to push it a bit further about uh, the fact that uh, actually companies need to, to send data to, to another country or another jurisdiction. And, and I'm seeing a, a kind of increasing realization, especially within the Commission, about the the infrastructures that are needed to do a digital life. So not only the legal infrastructure that Europe is uh, so good at producing, but also the material one. And I was wondering whether, Werner, you want to tell us a little bit more, how do you see the, the, the place of materiality and, and, and the servers and, uh, and the location and territoriality back into this uh, vision of a digital Europe? Yeah, with pleasure. Yeah, of course, it's exactly what you're saying. It is not just the legislation. That is one one piece, of course, yeah, to ensure that existing practices don't impinge on our rights and so on and so forth. The other is to, some noise. The other is that we in Europe build our own capabilities. That doesn't mean a fortress of Europe. Uh, it just means that we have the infrastructures ourselves. That we have a choice, uh, and that's you know this is part of this of this European decade twenty thirty where infrastructures, digital infrastructures, is one of the four pillars alongside skills and the public services and digitizing business. And within the infrastructures, not surprisingly, uh, data and cloud play an important role. 
Um, there's also obviously a lot of money flowing into building capacities, both from Europe, but also from member states and their recovery and resilience facilities or plans to implement those. Uh, we launched the European Cloud uh, Initiative. It's also about investing in the next generation of cloud, which is more the edge, edge computing uh, infrastructures. So there's a lot of things going on also on the private side, if you want Gaia X, which is a privately driven initiative, all with the same purpose of having as businesses or also as governments, the choice between European based infrastructures. Um, if you want to adhere to those principles, if those in principles are important to you, yeah, from privacy to security to what have you, interoperability, openness, uh, but of course you can still use the American hyperscalers if you want, but we want options available and there's a lot of investment going on to make this happen. Thank you very much, Werner. And uh, I wanted to ask you also another question about um, how to say uh, the difference between uh, businesses. So uh, a few of you hinted about the fact that uh, we are not all uh, of the same size, of the same power, of the same jurisdiction when we uh, claim our data rights or when we have to, to, to navigate uh, data rights. And I would like to, to push a little bit further on, on thinking about that and what are the implications. And I will start with the provocation. I remember during a, a similar panel a few years uh, back, uh, one of the big tech, I won't name it, uh, providing um, training and actually infrastructure to, to comply with the European data protection to small companies working on their platform. So don't you also see a problem of, of, uh, of uh, leaving to, to big actors uh, the, the role of, of creating a data protection culture uh, if data protection turns into kind of a checkbox exercise in which is too detailed uh, and everybody has to comply. So let's comply as soon as possible so we get rid of it to some extent. Uh, don't you see also risk in that, that uh, who has money, who has the power, who has the platform and the infrastructure will push other to, to have their own understanding of data protection, which may be very different from the data protection understanding defended by the European Parliament, for instance. Maybe Mia Petra, whether this is kind of a concern of the European Parliament of having lost the high ground of values, so to say, to the benefit of companies. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, your audio is turned off. Yes, no, I, I was wondering then the, the, the value the built in the, the whole chain of the data usage uh, is the question that we also uh, hope uh, and wait the data act to deal with uh, also uh, where the value is uh, created and to whom it belongs. belongs. Uh, I'm, I'm not thinking that uh, you should monetize the value like uh, this is mine because we needed data for good but it's not also the way to to have it only in the hands of some but i i, I just want to add here for the uh, kind of understanding the the why we do have these uh, infrastructure ideas as well and not to, to remain uh, what, what is existing also is the amount of the data so we are kind of in the beginning of the path that uh, if we believe that an amount of data is uh, like one times one and a half times more every two years so we are just in the beginning and ha handling the data of five percent of the uh, amounts in in 10 years and that's why i think we <clears throat> do have possibility to step into and not to, to think that uh, the data economy is here today and that's why I'm, I'm very open for the ideas that new uh, innovations will come new actors will come but then we have to have some rules for that Thank you very much. Yeah. I don't okay. know if there are other questions from the panel. David, I think so. Oh, no, 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 okay. If you want to please, uh, please, go please. to other No, I no, please, to... please, go ahead. I don't know whether I understood your remark well, but I had, I thought I understood that you were implying that big worldwide players would be examples of the culture of compliance, especially in data protection. I think it's the other way, other way around. Some of the players that pop up in my mind are probably not the best examples of a culture of compliance with regard to data protection. So they are more an example of the opposite. But uh, let, let me make this remark 
to to stress the importance i think what is really crucial is also that how should i say i i, I don't want to uh, shift the responsibility to the citizens but citizens also need to take care of their own rights and citizens really should we all should everybody listening and watching should once do an access request with facebook or with google just to see what you get it's amazing because i'm surprised when i hear that in belgium uh, belgian citizens are surprised that their home their google smart assistant or what is it that you put into the living room that it would be listening into them of course if you want it to react if you give a voice instruction then it needs to be listening whether you are giving the, that voice instruction and there are definitely ways of doing that proportionately and there are definitely ways of doing that disproportionately but people are not always sufficiently aware um, of their of their of their rights or, or or of the real risks we don't want to frighten them eh? think of the imaginable success of the aging app which was an app where you upload a picture and then you see yourself in 20 years or in 50 years from now if you're young enough and people were all using it but that it was a russian app and we don't we don't know where the data went so people are not always sufficiently aware in the area of data protection of the real risks uh, i think it relates and then i will uh, stop i think it relates to a human characteristic we have and i've said it before uh, we we have very much difficulties in making a judgment or a correct evaluation when we have a short-term benefit and a long-term cost. And that's exactly what we each time have in data protection. Shall I use Google Maps or shall I use my car's navigation? Mm. Well, Google Maps from time to time is easier. And that's the short-term sh short benefit. The long-term cost, nobody knows. And that's a problem, I think. Thank you for bringing that uh, to, 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 to our conversation. And I participated by, uh, to, to a EU funded research on data access right, and it was an amazing exercise. And the results were quite uh, amazing, both for European and for international companies. And uh, yeah, uh, but I also see, for example, that now Facebook has developed like a, you have this uh, button when you are uh, looking at uh, advertising. Uh, going back to what Werner was saying at the beginning, why is it just advertising? And I always found the reply like quite boring and, and definitely not the precise one. I keep being marketed as um, uh, like a middle age uh, towards 60 at least, uh, mm -hmm. woman of conservative taste, uh, both in, uh, in the politics, uh, a little bit less in garment. I found it funny because it gives me a different perspective on myself, but it also reminds me that uh, like, uh, I, I don't care to some extent, and also Facebook doesn't care, not getting me right, because they're working on a different kind of, uh, of uh, magnitude. Like if they get Rocco wrong, their business model doesn't fail. <laughs> And in that sense, I think that uh, there's a difference of understanding of what is at stake for people. If I get stopped at the border and searched, uh, my, my, even my short term uh, impact is very strong because I can miss a flight, a job opportunity and something else. So in that sense, we're not always talking about the same stakes for everybody at play. Um, I don't know if we can bring in questions from the audience. Uh, uh, I don't know where I can see them actually. Uh, if people can just turn on their micro. Otherwise, please do not hesitate to, to, to ask each other other questions. I, I think that we are still having a few minutes and quite a lot of material that you have brought into your first round of uh, presentation. So uh, please. Ellen. Um, thanks, Rocco. I, I just wanted to mention one of the particular challenges I was thinking of in the context of preparing for our discussion today, which is really around children. Um, and the specific mention now under the GDPR, just to go back to data protection for a moment, of, of the specific protections children merit. Although, of course, as we know, the GDPR didn't spell out in, in 
um, very clear detail because of the technology neutral approach that it takes. But but what's interesting, and, and I'd be interested to know if if David or Werner or Maya Petra or Laurie Anne have any um, perspectives on this. But what's interesting for us to see is that um, we in general don't seem to have cracked any innovative solutions to verifying the age of children on mixed content online platforms. It just doesn't seem to be possible across jurisdictions, across platforms, pro across devices. There is no interoperability. And yet we're all agreed children need to be identified on those mixed content platforms and protected. Um, so, so it's an interesting one and it's, a, it's, it's an uncomfortable one, I, I suppose, in terms of um, how this is going to be progressed and, and enforced in due course. I think is an important topic indeed. Solutions that you have seen, proposal right now on the horizon. Well, perhaps I can. Dorian, please, and then Mia Petra. Yeah. No, I, very quickly. I think um, we we are lucky enough to have some some guidelines from our data protection authority now, but. Um, it's clear that, um, to echo what you've just said, Helen, I don't think there is a clear, uh, clear cut technology um, solution to that issue. Um, and, and the approach in front is basically that declaration is not enough, but at the same time, collecting passport or any kind of identity check might be too intrusive. Um, the concern that we hear from clients on that topic is the fact that there is also some um, dif um, some differences between countries in the EU, and for um, non-EU um, actors um, targeting the EU market, it can be co become quite complex to address that specific issue in 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 the territory in the EU territory across the EU territory. And an additional layer of complexity, I think, is the fact that the solution might not be the same depending on the type of product that is being sold or the specific service that is being offered online. So I think there is very much a, on our side a case by case analysis to be um, to be taken um, to make sure that we we accurately respond um, to to the regulatory challenge. Thank you very much, Lorion. And uh, I will give the floor to Mia Petra. And after that, we will have to say goodbye and to move on to the next panel. Yes, uh, it, it's very important and, and difficult topic. And, and uh, as you mentioned, the derogation for the e-privacy that also Parliament approved was uh, not um, making many parliamentarians happy at all, but we saw it as a pressure for the big tech and, and hard lobbying because it's the derogation was done for the child pornography, Facebook mainly, that they cannot use some tools that we're using uh, before because we wanted to have more openness and transparency. But then suddenly it also included some text and text analysis to be included. And, and I don't know if the text is that much to do with the child pornography. So uh, one uh, specialist warned me that always the, ring the bells that if you hear the child pornography or if you hear the terrorism, because then all the politicians are easily listening to you and then say hands up if we cannot do anything else. So uh, I also always ring the bell first or, or, or will be very careful when looking at that. But saying that it, it is the concern and, and look and how to protect them. And I would just want to add here that I hope that the, we will uh, speed up the discussions on the dark patterns and manipulation and, and this kind of uh, um, addi addictions that the many platforms uh, create to children if there is like no ways to uh, play a game without being there every, once in 24 hours. Uh, I'm, I'm a father, uh, mother of a teenager, so it's getting a bit easier, but with the children that do want uh, not to be kicked out from their friends, and if they don't uh, make a squeak uh, in, in uh, uh, a day, they will lose their connection with the friends, or then they, somebody will come and destroy your village or whatever patterns you have. So I think, uh, yes, uh, we need to, to have some push to uh, 
plays and, and, and online services to protect the children. And it seems so far that it's not uh, loud enough what they are saying and doing themselves. So if not, nothing good happens, I, I beg permission to come up with, uh, with the protection uh, of the children online as well. Thank you very much. David, very quickly before they kick us out open? of the panel. Yeah, absolutely. Because of the importance of awareness raising, specifically to children, we invest as Belgian Data Protection Authority significant amounts in a special project, which is called a special website. And it's very successful. We want to raise those kids will be grown up with, with that digital technology much more than we do. So we want to enable them, make them aware. We invest a lot of resources. And just to say, the specific website for schools and children has more hits than our General Data Protection Authority's website. So we are quite good and successful in that too. Happy to, to hear this uh, promising news. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the panelists, for, for playing the game. Uh, and uh, thank you for the enticing conversation. And thank you to the organizer for inviting us uh, here today. Goodbye. <laughs>